A lot of you guys actually wanted me to compare Halloween 2 to Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, <laughs> and I just don't know. Maybe next year, next Halloween season, I will be ready to put myself through that again and watch that movie again, but it's too soon for me to do that right now. I think in 50 years, it will still be too soon, so I'm gonna go ahead and just push that off for another year. It's just because Rob Zombie really swung for the fucking walls with that one and like not in a good way. At least <sighs> yeah, all right, let's do this. Given that it's November of the following year, I think I've put off this video as long as I possibly could have. As you know, today I'll be comparing Halloween 2 from 1981 to Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 from 2009. I have lots of fun things to share from my research today, from this... I'm a demented individual, I think. ...to this... I was incredibly supportive. Why that piece of shit lied, I don't know. So if you want to know what that's all about, then stick around. But I do lots of fun comparisons like these, as well as a lot of other great horror content, so what are you gonna do? Are you just gonna fuck around, or are you gonna find out? Click subscribe and join the family. Very well done. Now that you've been imbued with the power of the haunted hippie, here is the structure for today's video. <coughs> Oh, excuse me. First, I'll get into all the background information, so box office, reception, etc. And I have already covered Halloween 2 versus Halloween Kills, so this video will mostly have a focus on Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Then we'll compare the plots of either film and the different directions they took. After that, we discuss character, how did either movie expand upon Laurie and Michael. Next, we'll have a style comparison, so mainly kind of covering the different tones of either film. Lastly, we'll discuss the themes of either movie, again with a focus on Rob Zombie's film because he really swung for the walls with that one. At the end, we'll tally everything up and we'll try to decide which is the superior film. So starting off with Halloween 2, I already covered pretty much all of the most interesting fun facts from the making of documentary in my video last year. So I won't be including any of that, but I did find a panel from about four years ago of the whole Halloween 2 crew. It was actually kind of a mess how many people they had on the panel there because there weren't enough chairs or microphones to go around, but I learned some fun new facts regardless. Somehow I never knew that director Rick Rosenthal and Nancy Stevens were married, aka a Nurse Marion, Smoking Marion. People have long thought that they met on the set of Halloween 2, but on this panel, Rick says that they met about a week prior. When Nancy was on the mic, it was really sweet because she was kind of talking about how she came back for the sequel, not even knowing the legacy that this or the prior movie would have, because they did film this movie just two years after the release of the first one. She and others also, of course, had very positive things to say about the late, great Donald Pleasance. In addition to being a consummate professional, he was very funny. And some of my scenes were in the car with him. And so they'd be changing the light or doing something, and Donald would say something hysterical. And of course, I'd be laughing. And then they call for action, and he's putting himself together impeccably and professionally. And I'm left there trying to pull myself together thinking about how funny he was. It's interesting because in the making of documentary especially, and on this panel, he's always praised for being super professional. He would come to set with not only his own lines memorized, but also everybody else's. So it's a little bit surprising that he was such a goober. His acting was apparently so good though, that sometimes they thought that he was actually getting hurt on set. The way he falls backwards against the curb, we were all really scared he was hurt. The acting was so good. Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis are definitely the most recognizable faces from this installment, but the other casting stories are really interesting as well. One of the most popular and well-known stories from this installment is, of course, how Dick Warlock got cast as Michael Myers. He showed up to Rick Rosenthal's office and didn't say a word. Even when Rick was getting super uncomfortable, he just continued to stare at him. Eventually, he was just like, yeah, okay, he can have the role. Lance Guest also stars in this movie, and now he's more well-known for his work in theater, but he was only 20 years old when they cast him in this film, and it was his first feature. What I found most interesting about casting, though, is how Gloria Gifford got put on the project. So I'll let her tell the story. My story is not like any of theirs. And you know why? Because I'm the only black woman that ever got to star in one of these movies Woo! before Tyler And the part that was written, that I played, was written, it actually said the script, 55-year-old white-haired lady. Rick, being the genius that he is, and he has changed my life three times already. But that time, he said, I think Gloria is authoritative enough to do this role. And I came in, I met Deborah. She said, no, I think she's too young. He said, uh, well, you know, we'll get the other nurses, and we'll see, and maybe she'll be a little older, and she'll be able to do it. And he made it happen. 
She goes on to say that the makeup team was really confused because when she showed up, the script hadn't been changed. It still said that she was supposed to be like a 55 year old white lady. Just thought that was a refreshing story, but not entirely uncommon. Generally, in most of my research that I've done, horror sets are by far the best sets that you can work on with the best people. It's not historically the most diverse genre for nothing, baby. As far as the rest of the development goes, I'm not gonna get too in depth on it because if you've been around, I've already covered it before. But basically the sequel only happened because of producer Erwin Yablons. He was basically the only one excited to do it. There was also a lawsuit that went on, but I covered this in my last comparison of Halloween 2. But as you hopefully know, Carpenter wrote the script mostly drunk off beer and he had no desire to direct, so that left the job to Tommy Lee Wallace. Quick tangent, this story became so well known that Budweiser recreated John Carpenter writing the script for one of their commercials, which is incredible. But Wallace also had no desire to be involved after a short time on the project, so then the job fell to Rick Rosenthal. I actually found this newspaper clipping from 1981 where he was interviewed and the title is hilarious. But in that article, he goes on to say that conceptually, it was definitely John and Deborah's vision, but in execution, it was his vision. But like I said, the producers were the most excited. Yablons and Mustafa Akkad put down $2.5 million as opposed to the very modest 300,000 they put down for the original. The theatrical distribution rights went on to Universal Pictures and they released it on October 30th in 1981. It made almost $7.5 million on its opening weekend, which is pretty wild considering if you adjust that for today's inflation, that will be $24.5 million. Its overall box office by the end of its run beat out the likes of Friday the 13th Part 2 and The Howling, which also both came out the same year. A review by Kevin Thomas came out in the Los Angeles Times and it was absolutely scathing, saying things like, there's a point at which no amount of mastery can redeem reprehensible content. He says, if you become aware of how you're being manipulated, you again may notice there's nothing motivating all the chills except some vague notion of primordial evil on the loose. As if that's not scary, like what? <laughs> Last quote, he says that it bases much of its appeal on the depiction of extreme violence against women. Other critics liken this movie to hardcore pornography and in general, critics just were not a fan of this film. On Rotten Tomatoes, over 50,000 audience members gave this a score of 63% and it sits at just a 30% with 46 critic ratings. Some people poo-poo the fact that I bring up the critical reception of these movies, but you have to understand that is basically how the general public viewed these films. We live in our own little horror bubble here, but it's important to consider the wider culture of the time. Critical success also partially dictates what studios will do. I also think it's really funny when critical reviews are bad because that's kind of a selling point for us fans. Just like how we got excited about the fact that people were fainting and throwing up at Terrifier 2. That kind of word of mouth marketing has not happened in years. Cheers to you, Art the Clown and Damien Leone. But in 1982, the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films nominated this movie for two Saturn Awards. It was nominated for Best Horror Film, but it lost to an American Werewolf in London. It was also nominated for Donald Pleasance for Best Actor, but he lost to Harrison Ford for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Moving on though, this film obviously helped to pave the way for the success of the rest of the franchise until we got the first remake in 2007. Not only one remake, but a sequel to Rob Zombie's Halloween, Halloween 2 from 2009. For this one, there weren't too many behind the scenes, so here's a little rundown of where my fun facts came from. I did watch the four hour and 20 minute behind the scenes documentary of the making of the first Rob Zombie's Halloween, and there was no info pertaining to this sequel, but hey, I was thorough. I did find a panel though that was actually from the same convention as the other panel that I found. I also found a few various exclusive interviews with Zombie and watched the cut comparison on the Dead Meat channel. Shout out James, thank you, Mr. Meat. It was hilarious though, they had the same issue as the other panel where they didn't have enough chairs and Scout brought her dog out, I was cackling. The event planner on that one was kind of slacking. But on this panel, Malka Cod confirmed something that I'd been a little bit suspicious of for a while now. Well actually, uh, what some people don't know, we were actually working on a Halloween night and uh, we just had so many character lines and things to answer. And we had a couple different groups of writers take cracks at it. Obviously, I had to take some time and just step away from it all. When we came back to it, I thought best to end this chapter there and come back with something really big and different and bold. And uh, who better than to shepherd something like that than Rob Zombie? 
So this confirms that Halloween H2O and Resurrection are officially part of the Thorn timeline. Ugh. He also had pretty heavy involvement with these two installments of the franchise, and he goes on to say that this subset of the franchise is very near and dear to his heart. There's lots of behind the scenes B-roll of him actually on set, as you can see. And in fact, he was the one to make an appearance at the 30 Years of Horror convention in 2008 to announce the sequel was in development, as reported by Dread Central in 2008. However, before he signed on, Rob Zombie was kind of hesitant because he cites the first movie as very exhausting to make. You're a little exhausted after making the first one, so I yes. kind of made you want to march forward for number two. I don't know. I, I'm a, a demented individual, I think, uh, <laughs> because it didn't. It wasn't any easier than the first one. Time heals all wounds, and enough time went by and I forgot, and about a year and a half after I had said no more, I started thinking like, well, I would like to go back and do more because I feel like there's so much more to be done with those characters that I didn't get to scratch the surface with in the first one. He went as far as to consider himself demented for returning for a sequel, but then luckily found a creative avenue to pursue with it. It turns out he was definitely in tune with his spidey senses because his experience on the sequel was not much better. In a bloody disgusting interview, he said, Making Halloween with the Weinsteins was a miserable experience for me, and so I was very reticent to do the second one. I felt like they weren't trusting me on the first one because they wanted to make sure it was a hit, and now they weren't trusting me to not fuck up their hit. They would show me scenes from Halloween to try to make a point, and I'd be like, yeah, I know, I made that movie. Why do you show me that like I haven't seen it before? I also found another video of his on the Joe Rogan experience. Listen, don't judge me for watching it and doing my research. Judge him for going on that show with that weird anti-vaxxer alpha brain bald fuck. Anyway, you can watch the important bits here on my channel because I watched it so you don't have to. You're welcome. Well, that was weird meddling. It was just like kind of psychotic meddling. How so? Like my phone was ringing all the time when I'm on set working and it'd be like, we think it should be this. I'm like, well, while I, you're working? Yeah, well, if I did that, then everything we shot doesn't match. Seems like working for the Weinsteins sucked, big shocker there. But in general, it seems like Rob Zombie fosters a very healthy and enjoyable set to work on. It's clear as day from the hours long behind the scenes documentary of the making of the first film. It's also evident by the fact that actors repeatedly come back to work with him. And he has a reason for this as well. I mean, I love working with the same actors again because you, you, you develop a shorthand and you get to know them. And the, the, the thing with actors is, when they don't know you, they're suspicious of you somewhat because they're all kind of insecure and they all want to look good. But once they know you and they trust you, they always give you more. Every actor in the behind the scenes footage always seems really relaxed and like they're having a good time. It's very evident there's a lot of trust built between them. So it's no wonder why all these actors wanted to come back for the sequel. In fact, I don't think there's another cast and crew from the Halloween franchise besides maybe from the recent trilogy that became so close. You know, I mean, fans are, are just great, but just being able to work with this family of people that you know, we're all still very close and it, it, they're just fantastic people, you know, it, it's a family. This cast and crew was so great to work with and uh, it was like a family and just this franchise just keeps growing, the family keeps growing and we're adding more and more to it. It's really like a phenomenon to see everybody and we all get back together with you all and uh, we're just going to keep adding more and more uh, relatives as we go along. It's really interesting to me that Malika Cod seemed to grow so attached to this group specifically, and I do actually believe him when he say that these installments hold a special place in his heart. And to this day, they're all friends. Daniel Harris and Scout Taylor Compton have their podcast together, and Daniel Harris is constantly trying to return to the franchise as well. On this panel, they also confirmed that originally they did want to make a third movie, but it seems like it was Rob Zombie himself who shot that down. So is, uh, are there still any yeah, thoughts kicking around for number three, or is this... Uh... No, I feel like number two did all I need to do, and number threes are always bad. <laughs> no matter what you want to do. I mean, one is something, two always seems to be the better film, and then three never works. I do think that it might have also had something to do with the critical and audience reception, but Zombie also confirmed this in an interview from 2009. But as you can see, he was just very mysterious and very cut and dry about it. I don't know if he's ever gotten more into the reason why, besides just saying that in general, third movies usually suck. Let's get into the infamous reception of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Now, they were given $15 million to make this movie, and they made it right back in their opening weekend. It was released on August 28th in 2009, kind of a weird time 
time, but it was released to over 3,000 theaters and it made over $16 million. Now that's more than Halloween 3, 5, and 6 made during their entire theatrical run, so that's pretty good. However, by only its third weekend in theaters, it dropped down to number 14 most popular. And so its grand total was just over $40 million. Critics were not having this movie, citing it as having extremely fresh ideas, but feeling like they were slapped together really messily. Rotten Tomatoes has it sitting at a 23% with 80 critic reviews and an audience score of 44% with over 250,000 reviews. It's a little bizarre to me that the original Halloween 2 has only 50,000 audience reviews, while this kind of remake sequel has over 250,000. Though it does make sense because the internet and Rotten Tomatoes were around back in 2009, but still you'd think that people would retroactively go back and log Halloween 2. But now what you've probably been waiting for, John Carpenter's reaction to Rob Zombie's Halloween films. You know what, let's refill. I would say that the first notable thing that I found from this interview is John Carpenter's reasoning for why remakes happen. I always thought, well, they know that it's gonna get them a big paycheck, but according to Carpenter, that's not all. He attributes the demand for remakes as being able to cut through all the noise while marketing. When it's a name that people already know, of course it's inherently just gonna grab more attention. But let's get into why he called Rob Zombie a piece of shit, shall we? Well, I would say nice things about him, but you know, we did this. I thought it was, it was gonna be a real cool deal for the, the History Channel, the Biography Channel, whatever that is. They were gonna do about Halloween. I thought, ooh, that's pretty cool. Anyway, they interviewed him on that on that biography and channel, and he lied about me. He said I was very cold to him when he told me that he was going to make it. Nothing could be further from the truth. I said, make it your own movie, man. You know, this is yours now. Don't worry about me. I was incredibly supportive. Why that piece of shit lied, I don't know. I don't know why Rob Zombie said that Carpenter was cold. In all my research and on IMDb, everywhere it says that Carpenter had said he told Zombie to make it his own. I think in my original review and reaction, I also brought that up as a fun fact. So I'm also just as clueless as Carpenter as to why he would say that, but also in my research, I couldn't find the original quote of Zombie even saying that. All the Google searches are heavily bogged down by all the headlines and all the stuff about the feud. Which, don't worry, according to a 2016 tweet from John Carpenter, that has been settled. They've buried the hatchet. In terms of his thoughts on the movies themselves, though, it's also not the most positive. Did you like it? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that he took away the mystique of the, of the story by explaining too much about the guy. I don't care about that. It's supposed to be a force of nature. He's supposed to be almost supernatural. Knowing about that uh, was, and he was too big. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't normal. <laughs> I think it's funny that this is what Carpenter says because this is my first time ever coming upon this interview, but those were my exact reasons why I didn't like his movie initially, Rob Zombie's film. If you go back to my old reviews, I constantly maintain that having Michael be so big is kind of like cheating and that Zombie ruined the mystery of Michael. I've since kind of tried to step out of that perspective and broaden my viewpoint a bit, but we'll get into that with the plot, which coincidentally should start right about now because that does it for the background on either film. Now, I've only ever seen the director's cut of Rob Zombies Halloween 2, so that's kind of what I'm basing my comparison on. I'm doing that because I feel like the director's cut just has far more to say, but I will briefly go over the differences between the cuts after I cover the plot of each movie. Though I do highly encourage you to check out the cut comparison on the Dead Meat channel because it's obviously much more thorough. Anyway, in Halloween 2, we pick up right where the original Halloween leaves off with Michael on the loose and Lori bedbound in the hospital. Dr. Loomis is on the lookout with local law enforcement while Michael's killing spree continues. When Loomis learns the information that Lori is Michael's long-lost sibling, he heads to the hospital immediately for one last fiery showdown in which Michael is defeated. In Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, we follow a disheveled Lori as she's trying to keep the pieces of herself from falling apart. Michael has been surviving in the wild, led by hallucinations of his deceased mother. Dr. Loomis is thriving on the success of his book, which Lori reads and discovers that she is Michael's sister. When all three of them meet again, it resolves as a hallucinatory crescendo with Michael and Lori being killed. I need to make a few distinctions between the director's cut and the theatrical cut of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 because a few things are drastically different. One of the main things is the portrayal of Lori. In the theatrical cut, she seems like she's mostly healed, whereas in the director's cut, she is a mess, and I would say it's a pretty accurate portrayal of someone dealing with a mental health crisis. The other biggest difference is in the theatrical cut, Michael kills Loomis and then Lori kills Michael, and she survives but ends up in an institution, whereas in the director's cut, it seems like that's more like a hallucination while she's dying. But it's time to compare 
right off the bat when we're talking about the plot, with either movie, there's not a whole lot going on. 1981 follows Michael on a rampage similar to basically any 80s slasher, and then 2009 is more of a character study. Story-wise, not a lot going on. The biggest differences I want to compare are between the characters, really. I guess though that the sibling relationship does do something unique in either film. In the original, it kind of drives the simplicity of Michael's motive and why he ends up back at the hospital with Lori. We don't know why he wants to kill his sister, but that's the reason and why he continues to go after Lori. In 2009, it completely complicates everything. There's still the simple layer of this is why he's making his way back to Lori and that that is the root of her most recent breakdown. However, this is a point that I will make until the day I die because this actually had the potential to be a really good serious film. If Rob Zombie did not insist on casting his wife in every goddamn last one of his films. This film in particular could have been completely saved because he adds the element that Michael is driven by these visions of his mother. The mistake begins in the very beginning of the film where he somewhat retcons his original installment. They recast Dig with the new young Michael and he is explaining that he's having these dreams about a white horse. Nope, no sir, no ma'am. Not only that, but then later on he's having visions of a younger version of himself. And the white horse is outrageous. I think it's a really interesting motif and I get that it's meant to represent uh, expressing powerful emotions like rage and anger. But it ends up being one of the most annoying motifs either because why does Sherry Moon Zombie need to be there? Also, why does young Michael need to be a part of the party? He's a constant reminder that the continuity is off. Now the worst offense of them all, my biggest issue with this, I want, come closer, come closer. I need you to hear this from my lips. The worst offense is that Lori starts to share these visions with Michael. That is not how mental illness works. That's stupid. Having the movie be a character study on Lori where she succumbs to the same mental illness as Michael is brilliant, but the execution is horrible. Even if it's the same hallucinatory mental illness as a sibling, nobody will ever share a hallucination with someone else. There's foreshadowing of this in the director's cut where Lori sees a white horse in the Rorschach test at her therapist office, suggesting she's beginning to see the same vision. So in theory, it's all kind of cleverly constructed because in the beginning it's this really fiercely accurate portrayal of a mental health crisis. Typically one of the most outward signs is when your relationships start to fail and you try to mask it. Lori's relationship with Annie was crumbling, she was getting really intoxicated to try to cover it up, which is good stuff, keep it up. So call me a nutter butter, but I think the plot would have worked tremendously better without Michael, at least in a literal sense. If Lori was having hallucinations or dreams about Michael, I think that could have been really interesting. And you know what would have topped off the fucking cake because they kind of allude to it in this movie is if Lori became the new Michael and started killing people. As is, the movie is a real shit show plot wise, so that's a bummer. I think it's a real missed opportunity too because they do nothing with the sibling connection in 1981. Lori has dreams about a past life, it seems, but it's unclear if she ever actually learns about the connection. It seems that Zombie kind of expanded upon that concept, but he always denies that his movie has anything to do with the original sequel. I mean, it has nothing to do with the original Halloween, too. I can't even remember what that movie is like. The whole movie takes place in a hospital and a girl gets killed in a hot tub and it's all this silly stuff like that. Ours has a brief hospital scene at the beginning because it picks up immediately after the last film, so yeah, I had to resolve. Mm, okay, Rob. Because we have Lori having visions of her mother and a young Michael when there's no possible way that imagery could be in her subconscious. Again, that's not how mental illness works. When you're a baby, all you see is colors and shapes. There is literally not a way to form crisp memories, not even in your subconscious. So while I do understand why there's a pretty big camp that tout this movie as a misunderstood masterpiece, I think their praises are founded on inaccuracies. I also don't love the fact that at the end of the day, this movie's horror is kind of predicated on the audience's belief that mental illness scary. It just doesn't feel like Zombie is like fully aware of what he's doing there. I do wonder how things would have shaken out if he hadn't taken the more realistic route with Lori's mental health initially and just made the entire movie a fever dream? Like, would that have been for better or for worse? I don't know. The last thing I'll say is that I do think I prefer the ending of 81 in its fiery simplicity, though I do kind of love the darker tone of Lori being killed in the director's cut of the remake sequel. As far as the theatrical versus director's ending of 2009, I think the theatrical ending is much better, but the director's cut is much more impactful. So that'll do for the plots. I say we start to compare our characters. Let's start out with Miss Annie Brackett. In 81, yes, she is deceased, so not much to note, but I love 
thrilled that she survives Halloween 2007, especially because of what Danielle Harris brings to the table. There's so much focus on Lori that you almost forget that she's not the only survivor until Annie is like, hey, my life has been hell too. That makes her death so much more upsetting because she was a survivor too and she put up with her best friend falling apart while she's dealing with her own shit for two years. Annie is a strong character, she's better than me. I identify more with Lori because when I'm having a really bad bout of anxiety, I am not fun to be around. I also get really irritable and physically sick, which is super fun, and it's why I identified more with this movie on the second go around, but more on that later. Speaking of Laurie Strode, she is treated remarkably differently in these films. In 81, the mental health route they choose is shock, and so Laurie is basically sidelined for the first two acts of the film. Not that shock isn't a completely logical reaction, but it's a bit boring, and we don't get to connect with her very much as a character. Because in 2009, we start with Laurie the night of in total shock, and then that's built upon. In 81, she's also quite literally drugged up, I believe, which is an odd move to totally placate her for most of the film. I don't have much pushback to that though, because other than it not being cinematic, it's like logically and realistically a good route to go. However, I think you can say the same for Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, and then Laurie was the central focus of the film. If the first movie was a character study on Michael, then the sequel is kind of the companion piece to that. When I watch Halloween 2007, it annoys me so much because I feel like she's the least accurate portrayal of a teenage girl. When I was a teenager, my friends and I were kind of raunchy behind closed doors, but we would never make sexual jokes towards our parents, you feel me? In the sequel, they strip away everything that made her annoying, and I feel like she feels like a very real person to me. Much more well-rounded, I think, than 81, because I don't get the sense that she is just her trauma. I can commend Zombie that he didn't just go woman traumatized while writing her character treatment, because yeah, everything was very centric to her trauma, but she did everything in her power to kind of get away from it. She was going to therapy, she was going to parties with friends, she didn't seem miserable and broken the entire time. She felt like a very real person who just happened to be going through all of this. Upon my first viewing, I did find her character to be really annoying, but I think as you grow up and you experience more mental health issues, you can kind of empathize and be like, yeah, actually she's a pretty well-written character. As far as comparing them goes, I think that they both serve the movie that they're in, so I need to have a think on that. Another place where I have a hard time choosing my favorite is with Dr. Loomis, so let's discuss. In 81, Loomis is running around doing everything in his power to track down Michael, and he's the same loony doctor from the first movie. He doesn't undergo any character development, he's just sort of the third act hero in either film, and there's nothing wrong with that. I do think he was maybe a little bit more unhinged in the second movie. I've been trick or treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. <laughs> He was well-intentioned nonetheless. Loomis in 2009 is a very interesting case study. I think that his B-plot is actually the most important one of the film. Loomis represents what society does to tragedy, but we'll have to get into that more with the theme portion of the video. He as a character is again sort of an extension of who he already was in the first film. You haven't said a word for 15 years. That's nearly twice as long as my first marriage. It's strange, Michael. In a weird way, you become like like my best friend, to show you how fucked up my life is. And that makes me feel like Michael was a vanity project to him because what a weird thing to say to a patient that hasn't spoken in 15 years. Who was but a boy when you first started treating him. That's your best friend? No, I think that he was a manipulative weirdo who wanted to juice Michael for content. So him escaping and going on a killing spree was kind of the best case scenario for Dr. Loomis. That's made very evident by him capitalizing off of it in the sequel. There's some lighter moments with Dr. Loomis because he's sort of living a parallel universe. Lori Strode and those other people are, you know, they're lower class, middle, you know, they're living their lives trying to put together, and he's sort of got this newfound celebrity. In 2009, Loomis is kind of the antithesis of Lori, but they have to pass through the same gauntlet of coming up against Michael. In this sense, I feel much more like I'm watching a movie with 81, and much more like I'm watching real people in 2009. Speaking of not so real people, the last character to compare would be Michael Myers. In 81, he is a brother, he, he's a supernatural killing brother, and in 2009, it's the same, but he has visions, and rather 
than being a supernatural entity, he's more like a horribly mentally ill drifter. The differences don't really get more complex than that, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about their looks and the masks and whatnot. I'm not a fan at all of the look in 1981. I'm fully aware it's the exact same mask as the original, and it's no fault of Dick Warlock's, but it just didn't fit him very well. You can fully see his eyes. I don't understand the choice to have these close-ups on his face at all. And the portrayal is also fine. Dick Warlock is fine, but he's just not like one of my favorites. Now, strangely, Michael in 2009 is to Lori in 81. I don't like what they did with this whole look and vibe, but it was the most logical and realistic choice. Not the visions, let's be very clear, but the fact that he is this drifter who doesn't know how to move through the world and his mask gets withered and destroyed, it makes sense. Michael Myers is existing out there in the world. It's just that you don't recognize him because nobody knows what he looks like. It's not like they have photographs of him even of him with the mask because he popped up, killed people in this spirit. During the Reagan years when they were closing down mental hospitals, just dumping the patients onto the street. So you see these crazy people lying by garbage cans that could be complete psychotics. And I thought, well, it's kind of interesting that Michael Myers is sort of like living out there in the world. That's why he's like this kind of like big bearded guy. Of course this was going to anger fans specifically because this is not what Michael does, especially because he speaks. For oh God in hell, die! Oh! Now, this was unnecessary. Rob, you were kind of dirty for this. It would be different if he said something more profound, like to Dr. Loomis saying, you were never my friend, or welcome to hell, sister. But he says, die. <laughs> Okay. At least they had the foresight not to let Michael speak in the original sequel. He's also completely unmasked by the end of 2009, which is odd, but I think it's one of the most interesting departures of this sequel. Because at the end of the day, Rob Zombie's Michael Myers was not this infamous boogeyman. He was just this severely mentally ill person. And I think that that was kind of to push his point, that they were showing Michael's humanity. Because that's what Rob Zombie's films seem to all be about, their case studies on humanity. Now, was it a messy and pretty inaccurate portrayal of of mental illness by the end, yeah. People do not share hallucinations, but I get the intent. And I think that wraps up our discussion on character, so let's get into style. I think that 81 honestly did a bang up job as a companion piece to the original. The camera movements and suspense they built up in the kill scenes feel very on par with the original, especially the kitchen sequence and the girl on the phone. They utilize the hospital setting very well. It has an extremely eerie emptiness, so the vibes of the movie are really good. Where it loses me a little bit is the fact that it was making itself very known as a direct competitor to the rise of slashers that came up after the release of the original. There's a bit more blood and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think in them adding that kind of excitement, they forgot to make the rest of the movie interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry. The first sequel just doesn't do that much for me because it's definitely the most basic slasher of the entire franchise. There are far worse movies in the franchise, do not get me wrong, but I think that this is just kind of the most basic among them. Rob Zombie said, Uno Reverse. He said, let me make the most complicated Halloween movie that anybody has ever seen. Well, and then in 2022, David Gordon Green said, hold my beer. But anyway, something interesting to me is kind of Rob Zombie's attitude on comedy in horror and what makes a great horror movie. Yeah, I mean, the killing in this movie is, I want it to be very real because obviously in a lot of these movies, Friday the 13th type movies, the killings get very big. They're meant to get a big like, woohoo out of the audience, but they're pretty goofy. Whereas for me, a memorable killing is the scene in like America American History X where he tells the guy to bite the curb and then he kicks the back of his head. That I remember. I don't remember anything from any Friday the 13th movie. This movie's very dark and very humorless all the way through because people are like, oh, you gotta have humor to balance the horror. Then I go, wait a minute, nothing funny in The Exorcist. There's nothing funny in Silence of the Lambs or The Shining. And you, when you list like, these are the greatest horror movies ever made, I'm like, who made up that rule? Now, of course, I have pushed back on that because I always say that horror and comedy are two sides of the same coin, baby. If you've been around, you know that I am a proponent of comedy and horror. Always have been, always will be. Also, a lovely coincidence that Jordan Peele just went on The Daily Show and he said this. I, I think the comedy part of my career is still going. I think it's still active. I, I talk about it as sort of like the difference between comedy and horror is the music. Stephen King has made similar sentiments, and I can't remember, I have featured an interview where he is likening comedy to horror, but I can't remember which video that's in. To Zombie's credit, I think a lot of his movies feel a little bit too real for me, and that's not why I watch movies. I don't need deaths to be super realistic because I watch movies as a form of escapism. And that's the fun of slashers, because yeah, I know I'm gonna die someday, but I'm definitely not gonna die like these assholes. For some people, they don't want it to be fun. They wanna see the real brutality, randomness, and unforgiving nature 
nature of death. So I don't really get it, but I understand that that is why Rob Zombie has his fans, because that's kind of his whole style. It definitely has its purpose, you know, it kind of brings reality back to the slasher, and it makes death scary again, but I would rather feel comfortable with death, because I think that watching horror is an amazing and cathartic way to kind of desensitize yourself to death. Because humans are actually born with this innate fear of it, but it's the most natural thing that happens to us. Some people want to be scared though, so rock on. There's also the very obvious stylistic difference between basic slasher and surrealist nightmare, so I don't think I need to get into that. The last note that I want to make on the style is the difference in the scores. 1981 kind of utilizes this beefed up version of the original score, and so a lot of people are a fan of that. <laughs> In the past, I've said the only thing that I like about this score is the organ sounds they layer in. And what Zombie does with his scores is much different. At times of the violence, it, rather than having music trying to drive it, it was more like sound scapes of Michael's mind. That's why a lot of times we, I would strip out the natural sounds in the room and you just hear these weird sounds as if you're in Michael's head, like the ringing in his head. I think that's a really cool, more artistic take on the music, especially given the subject matter they're dealing with with this one. It's very cerebral. I think I'll conclude by saying that style-wise, both movies do a bang-up job following up their original. And now kids, it's time for the grand finale. Let's discuss the themes. I've made this pretty clear in my comparison of Halloween 2 to Halloween Kills. I don't think that 81 is really trying to say much of anything. It was written by a very reluctant screenwriter who was just kind of trying to keep up with the trends of the time. Luckily, there is no lack of theme to uncover in the remake sequel. And I've already been over a lot of the mental health stuff from the remakes. I think that's the most obvious theme, right? I don't know if it's meant to be saying anything about society at large. I interpret it as more of an individual thing, like how tragedy affects the individual. We have this really interesting juxtaposition between Lori and Loomis that I want to explore. One of my favorite dynamics about this movie is jumping back and forth from Dr. Loomis ruining lives and then us seeing the lives that are ruined. And I have a very real life example of this, so walk with me. Imagine that we see Ryan Murphy giving a house tour of his giant mansion and then that's immediately cut with a woman who is crying who has been re-traumatized by his show Dahmer. That is basically what Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 showed us. You can become very successful, anyone can, but unless you are a genuine talent, you probably probably have to sell part of your soul to do that. Ryan Murphy is someone who, in my opinion, used to have really great original ideas, who now exploits tragedy for greedy consumers. And this is not to say that people are immoral for consuming something like Dahmer. It's obviously not that black and white. I will personally say that I am never planning on watching that show. And I do challenge you, if you watch the show, to also kind of reflect on the experience and kind of ask yourself why you're able to casually consume content like that. Because it's something that is tangibly hurting people. They've now had to come forward and say this does nothing to recognize my pain. In fact, all my trauma just gets brought to the surface every time a new show like this comes out. And again, of course, most of the people that watch this show are blissfully unaware of all of the hurt and trauma behind the scenes. Because when so much content is made about stuff like this, it completely mythologizes the real stuff that happened. People are really desensitized to the fact that it is people's real sons, cousins, brothers who were brutally murdered in in a lot of cases under racially motivated circumstances. And so in a weird way, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 is more relevant than ever. I don't think that he even realized at the time how timeless his own movie could be. It's also very interesting that I'm bringing Dahmer up yet again when we just talked about this during my comparison talking about Halloween ends. The more that you look into the franchise and really dig deep into it, the more that you realize the newest trilogy is this very weird amalgamation of everything that came before it. But since we kind of already covered all the mental health stuff, that's really all I wanted to get into with a theme comparison, so I say it's time for our final comparison. So Halloween 2 1981 versus Halloween 2 2009, how do they stack up? One is a direct continuation basic slasher, and the other is a very intense character study on mental illness. So weirdly, I think I prefer the direction of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, though I think this comes down entirely to personal preference. I just happen to prefer movies that are a lot more thought-provoking. In terms of characters, I weirdly have to give it up again to Rob 
Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 because the characters are the vessels through which the theme was explored. Now, even though I do love a more thought-provoking film, I think style-wise, I do prefer 1981. It has the feel of the original, the atmosphere is nostalgic and creepy, it's just a good time. The remake is also a little bit too intense for me to enjoy myself, you know? And then in terms of themes, I do kind of have to give it to Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, but I only give it a half point because it kind of fumbled the bag. It was great until it wasn't when dealing with mental illness. Now, upon my rewatches, we have an interesting phenomenon. I enjoy 1981 a little bit less upon every rewatch because for a lot of the runtime, there's a whole lot of nothing going on. And I've only seen 2009 twice now, but I enjoyed it immeasurably more upon my second viewing. But if you ask me which movie I'm more likely to rewatch, I am gonna say Halloween 2 from 1981 because it's just a little bit more light and enjoyable. Now it's weird because in the past, I thought that I would never want to rewatch Rob Zombie's Halloweens, but now I feel like I can be a little bit more desensitized to the crassness and just enjoy them for what they are. So maybe someday I will actually love them, who knows? So honestly, I know that this will piss people off, but I'm kind of at a stalemate today. In a truly wild turn of events, these movies have tied because they bring such different things to the table. I know that a lot of you are furiously disagreeing with me in the comments right now, and I'll just let you know that I don't judge you either way which movie you love more, but please just don't tell me that 2009 is a masterpiece because it absolutely is not. In fact, I do think that that is a little bit insensitive to people who are genuinely mentally ill, so please don't speak from a place of inexperience, and also please, please be kind to one another because I want to know all your thoughts. Let's talk about it. But before I go, this video would not have been possible without my patrons. A huge thank you to the people who supplement my income on days when I am researching, writing, filming, and editing. Basically, any day that I don't release a video or go live, these people kind of keep me afloat. And in return, I do release four to six bonus videos every month over there. And they are exclusive to Patreon. So if you want to get those bonus videos, the link is down below. But if that's not for you, all the rest of my social media is also down below, along with my Amazon on wish list if you're feeling generous, but I also have affiliate codes and some resources and stuff, so check it all out. More than anything, I just hope that you enjoy this video and that you stick around. So until next time, babes, bye! <coughs> <sighs> Choose another video. Go on, go watch one.